Good afternoon. My name is Meredith Coutrere, and on behalf of the Center for Early Medieval Britain and Ireland, we are very pleased to welcome Professor Rory Naismith from Corpus Christi College at the University of Cambridge. He is the author of the wonderful book out last summer, Making Money in the Early Middle Ages. Professor Naismith, you're very welcome. Thank you very much indeed, Meredith, and uh, thank you for the invitation. I'm very, very pleased to be here. Now, the Venerable Bede, there he is, died on the 26th of May, 735. And in the course of his 61 or two years of life, he would have seen and heard about a lot of important economic changes in the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms. Many of these led to people being able to obtain a wider range of goods at markets, above all at the bustling Emporia, which were effectively permanent quasi-urban markets situated at a few strategic points in the landscape, such as Ipswich, London, Southampton, and York. As a priest and a monk, Bede might have particularly approved of the surge in foundation of large churches, usually called minsters, of which hundreds appeared across England during this time. The minsters may well have been major consumers and producers, and in an agrarian society such as this was, that meant they could only flourish on the basis of a healthy farming sector, which would mean people growing and rearing more surplus. Hints of intensification can be seen here too in excavations of rural settlements and evidence for changes in cultivation. Last but not least, Bede would have probably have been aware that England in his own day was awash with silver. Silver pennies had appeared around the time of his birth and become a major fixture of the economic landscape in the decades that followed. Bede died more or less at the high point of this phenomenon, and had he lived another 10 or 20 years, he would have seen a marked contraction in the monetary economy. So Bede's life thus encompasses a remarkable set of economic changes, and there is broad consensus among archaeologists and historians that England in the long 8th century, which really means the late 7th to the early 9th centuries, was a relatively wealthy, dynamic place with minsters and their products like manuscripts and stone buildings as the most vivid, articulate survivals of the age. But there is less confidence about how and why this transformation came about, especially in its early stages around the time of Bede, and what this talk will consider is how and why these changes began when they did. Now, the monetary system provides a valuable starting point because its growth was both very swift and very traceable. Coins were not new in the age of Bede. Gold shillings or tremises had been made since about the year 600 in England, inspired by contact with those from contemporary Gaul. These were very valuable coins, and although the number of finds of them has increased in recent decades, they remain rare relative to the silver that would come later. They also started to be debased with silver from almost as soon as they began to be made, um, such that by the middle decades of the 7th century, the gold content of these, in quotation marks, gold coins, uh, was very low, down to 10% by weight or less. Eventually, sometime in the 660s or 670s, the penny dropped, pun intended, and the English decided simply to make silver coinage of what were already known as pennies. There are now some 7,000 recorded finds of early silver pennies from England, which were made and lost between about 670 and 750. The humble early medievalist is normally put in their place when figures like this are set next to equivalents from the Roman period or the later Middle Ages, but in this instance the comparison is not quite so chastening. If one thinks only of gold and silver coins, the age of the early pennies compares pretty well. In fact, these decades saw more silver coins being used and lost than any other equivalent period between about 400 and 1200. One can only wonder how many coins there were in circulation originally. At the first point when it is possible to get some idea of this, which is when minting records first appear in England in the decades around 1300, each known find of a coin stands for at least 10,000 others that were not lost, possibly a lot more than 10,000. 7th century coins were broadly similar in weight and metal, but smaller in size, each one weighing less, about a gram, um, but they are also small and chunky, usually less than 10 millimetres in diameter. Also, the buying power of 7th century coins was significantly greater, so if anything, I suspect the number being lost may actually have been even smaller in relative terms than in the 13th and 14th centuries. No certainty, is no certainty is possible, but it is worth stressing that this probably was a relatively rich monetary economy with tens of thousands of pennies made for each one that survives now.
These are sobering figures, but there is also no consensus on how the coins should be interpreted. The vast majority of early pennies carry no inscription. So who issued them is unclear, and when and where they were made can only be determined in general terms. This, if I can turn my page, um, this was also a very complex coinage, with hundreds of significant varieties that circulated together. Lots of agencies seem to have been involved. The best guess, based on the few inscribed issues and cautious interpretation of iconography and fine distribution, suggests that some were produced under the patronage of minsters and some under that of kings, but the very granular nature of circulation does not point towards major kings and kingdoms taking a large role in the currency. This seems, effectively, to have been a monetary free-for-all, a world in which issuing coins, and specifically one's own coins for one's own purposes, became a desirable thing for figures and institutions with wealth. This raises another set of long-standing puzzles on where these pennies came from. There must have been a lot of silver available to sustain the burst of monetization seen in the late 7th and early 8th centuries. The source of the silver has long been unclear. Various ideas were floated over the years, most of them modelled on explanations um, that were the more prevalent for the later Middle Ages, um, and these favoured exogenous factors. Um, that is to say, uh, things like a new mine coming online, something that suddenly injected a new supply of silver. Um, the mine that people tend to fasten on was Mel in Western France, or perhaps there was an unknown one somewhere in Germany. I and various other people got so fed up with being asked this question about where did the silver come from that we decided to find a more confident answer. And fate dealt us a good hand here because I had some project funding from the AHRC that was meant to pay for a conference in January 2022, but then the Omicron variant of COVID arrived in November and December 2021 and the event had to shift online meaning that it was more or less free, and so when the possibility of investigating the sources of silver came up in discussion, there was money available to do something. Crucially, there were also people with the requisite skills, specifically Jane Kershaw and Stephen Merkel, who were in the midst of a project looking at uh, precisely this sort of question with reference to Viking silver in the 9th century. The final piece of the puzzle was the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge, which kindly agreed to let us work on their coins. And they've got a phenomenal, phenomenally rich, broad collection of early medieval stuff. And all of this meant that we could sample a very broad selection of coins without having to go round multiple collections. In the event, we analysed 50 coins. You can see us doing it here um, in Cambridge. Um, Jane has seen this picture a number of times, and I think is a huge fan of it. Um, uh, so we analysed our 50 coins, and we got two kinds of data from, from doing so. Detailed information about their elemental composition, uh, which is important because trace elements are sometimes diagnostic of metal origins, and also information about the isotopic makeup of the lead that these silver coins contained, which again is useful because this can tell you something in very delicate terms about the origin of the metal, because most silver that was being used at least in Europe and the Mediterranean at this time was derived from lead ore. Now, the results of this uh, laser ablation analysis were very surprising. They showed us that there was a high degree of homogeneity in the sample that we analysed, which for the late seventh and uh, sorry for the late seventh century meant coins from England, Frisia, and Northeast Francia. Those are not distinguishable; they're using very much the same silver. But the silver that was used in this northwest European region was not from any known local mine. In particular, it did not match the characteristics of Mel in Western France, which is the main known source of fresh bullion in Merovingian and Carolingian Europe. It also did not match late Roman silver of the kind found at Hoxon, um, uh, Traprain Law, or the Esquiline Horde, and which was recycled in Pictland into the 7th century. The metal of the early pennies was, however, a compelling match for lead and silver objects from the early medieval Eastern Mediterranean the Byzantine Empire. It is very similar, for example, to these things, the collection of Byzantine silver vessels and spoons deposited in Sutton Hoo. These weighed at least 10 kilos, so it would have made approximately 10,000 pennies if melted down. There was a lot more work needed to flesh out how this connection worked. It might be possible to narrow down the major sources within the Byzantine Empire. Analysis of other objects um, besides coins from across Western Europe might give a better idea of when this stock of silver appeared and how widely it was used. 
Um, at the moment, no firm answers can be given, though clearly there is a good project to be pursued here. What can be said, though, is that this supply of eastern silver was very probably not arriving fresh in the 670s and after. The Sutton Hoo treasure was deposited at least a generation before the sudden and strong pivots towards silver coinage began. By that time, the once rich Byzantine production of silver coin and plate was in fast decline. Moreover, the late 7th and early 8th centuries were a low point in terms of east-west trade across the Mediterranean. This is important with reference to Northern Europe because it suggests that the large stock of silver behind the coins was there already in other forms. Something changed to make it more desirable to have coins rather than silver plate. Now, two myths need to be laid to rest before proceeding with what did lie behind the silver boom of the late 7th century. First, adopting silver was not just a matter of running out of gold and switching to the next best option. Embracing silver represented a real and significant break with earlier practice, a conscious decision to do things differently. Indeed, in some ways, it was not that much of a break at all. Silver was the principal metal used in the debasement of gold earlier in the, gold coins earlier in the 7th century, and silver objects such as brooches were commonplace in England and Frisia and Francia in and before the 7th century, not least as the dominant element in the latest portion of the Staffordshire hoard. Even so, gold stocks probably were straightened by the mid-7th century. Um, since the time of Henri Pirenne, um, the collapse of gold supplies in the West has been tied to strains in East-West exchange. And while the basic point is probably right, warfare was not the only reason, and explanations for it are no longer, or at least not only, sought in the military conquests of the early caliphs. Constricted supplies also reflect new policies inside the Byzantine Empire, where the exigencies of the worsening military situation and fiscal retrenchment curtailed the outflow of gold, concentrating what there was on internal needs. The response to this situation varied regionally. In the kingdoms of Visigothic Iberia and Lombard Italy, increase, increasingly debased gold coinage persisted for centuries. Again, it needs to be emphasised that the move towards silver coin in Northern Europe, especially on the scale seen in England, was by no means natural or inevitable. The second uh, myth is that the move to silver did not mark the creation of a mass market currency. Data on prices from the late 7th and early 8th centuries are effectively non-existent, but a denarius of comparable weight and fineness in Francia in the 790s could buy 12 £2 loaves of high-quality wheat bread. It was an appreciable sum. At the same time, a penny was significantly less valuable than earlier gold coins. The buying power of coins did not depend exactly on the amount of precious metal they contained, but the widespread equivalence of gold to silver in later times was 1 to 10 or 12. The silver pennies seem then to have been aimed at a middling economic level. They represented an amount that was still substantial, but accessible enough that most people in society would probably have used them at least some times. As a result, the use of coin broadened in a way it had not done since the late Roman period. The placement of pennies in graves in the southeast of 7th century England suggests that access to coins played a significant part in constructing social identity, as argued by John Naylor and Chris Skull. They were more numerous than earlier deposits of gold coins and burials, and, moreover, were not pierced or mounted, um, as a high proportion of earlier examples from graves had been. The silver pennies may have been included as a metonym for the economic agency brought by monetization, along the lines of what Georg Simmel argued for much later times. The value of coined money was encoded in much more than a piece of stamped metal. Deep hierarchical, historical and religious associations adhered to coins from the context of their manufacture and initial distribution, and were also reflected in the extensive range of iconography seen at this time. These symbolic resonances helped rather than hindered circulation, for they played a major part in legitimising a neutral form of exchange, anchoring coinage to forces and traditions that transcended individual relationships. Put simply, the onset of the early pennies hints not just at a lot more coins around, but at a society where coined money carried new, broadened social meaning, one in which money had begun to speak more loudly than it had in centuries. Again, though, we run up against the question of why it arose so quickly, especially if it is not possible to invoke the usual explanation of a, a new mine just coming online. Something must have changed closer to home, and it may well have been something to do with how demand was configured on a demographic level. When Bede looks back over his great survey of 7th century England, the ecclesiastical history of the English people, 
um, he drew up a timeline of key events in each year. And in the year 664, um, one thing he picked out in stark terms was, and the plague came, et pestilentia venit. Uh, this marked the beginning of Britain's final bout of late antique bubonic plague, the disease that had afflicted large parts of Europe, Asia, and Africa since the mid-6th century. The last experience with plague in Britain apparently lasted on and off until 687. Its impact is largely known from the pages of historical narratives by Bede, Adamnan of Iona, and other ecclesiastics. John Madicott has expertly assembled and assessed their testimony. A priest called T.G. Uh, was said in the earliest life of St. Cuthbert to have remembered the mortality that depopulated many places. And Bede observed that it laid low a vast number of people and caused widespread havoc both in Britain and in Ireland. Several monasteries were decimated. I got this nice picture. Somewhere at home, I've got a children's book from the 1980s all about Bede and Abbot Chailforth, which has a lovely drawing of all these monks dying of plague in Wearmouth Jarrow. But alas, I, I couldn't find it, so we're, we're stuck with this. Um, at Bede's Jarrow, all of those who could read, preach, or say the antiphons and responsories were snatched away by plague, save the abbot himself and a lad who had been brought up and educated by him. And there was a good chance that the lad in this story was Bede himself, for whom the plague would have been a direct and painful memory. If Bede and his contemporaries are taken at their word, the 7th century plague devastated Britain. The difficulty is that its consequences cannot be reliably traced beyond the pages of these literary texts. No other documents report the occurrence or effects of plague, nor are there any obvious archaeological vestiges. This visitation of the plague did not leave a trail of mass graves or any burials in which remains of the Yersinia pestis genome have yet been found. That said, there are only four mass graves known from England, even for the period of the Black Death in the 14th century, and there is enough other evidence to leave no doubt of its impact. Nor is it inherently unlikely that a visitation of plague would have cut a swathe through the 7th century population, even allowing for its smaller size and dispersed, overwhelmingly rural character. This was no defence for some similar regions in the 14th century, a point recently highlighted by Orla Benedicto. The absolute size of the population of 7th century England and the extent of its possible decline are a matter of guesswork. From a demographic point of view, the early Middle Ages are a void that gapes between the very tentative estimates of the Romano-British population of maybe 2 million at its height, and those arrived on a, a slightly but still, still tentative basis from Doomsday Book in 1086, which puts the population then at a little over 2 million. And the question is what happened in between. It is presumed broadly in line with the rest of Western Europe that a late and post-Roman phase of population decline turned around and began to rise in the 7th century or the 8th, which would be compatible with the story of terrible plague coming in waves in the 6th and 7th centuries. Plague has long been acknowledged as a factor in pushing an already depressed or static population even lower, perhaps to its medieval low point, but it may also have helped to put in place the conditions for change in the years that came after. As in the later Middle Ages, it may well have taken a long time for the population in England to recover from the plague. If the 7th century plague did cause significant mortality across society, its consequences could have helped precipitate the economic changes seen in the later 7th century, the foundation of minsters, the growth of emporia, and rapid monetization in silver. It was, to be sure, not the only factor at work, but it was a sudden and severe shock with the potential to cause a catalyzing effect. In the short term, there should be no doubt that its impact was dire in every respect. Um, but within a few years, the survivors may well have started to reap what James Bellich has called a plague bonus. Disruption to economic and social dynamics led to a redistribution of resources, opening the door for some members of society to do very well, or at least do things differently. Patronage of minsters would reflect the deaths of aristocrats and consolidation of land rights into fewer, richer hands, and some of these survivors may have chosen to transfer some of their property to the developing church. Before long, those minsters would themselves become major foci of wealth and demand. Other changes might reflect a disrupted relationship between aristocrats and cheolas, or free farmers. The bulk of Cholas could reasonably be described as peasants in formal terms, in that they farmed land on a settled basis, primarily for subsistence, although the designation of Cheol was a legalistic and not a, not a strictly economic one, um, and it, it therefore embraced a wide variety of people who were neither enslaved nor Yezithkund or Eolkund, which were the usual terms for aristocrats. 
The latter at this time probably consisted of kings, those whose families had recently been kings but lost out in layered intrigues of early Anglo-Saxon politics, and then finally those recently elevated by the action of kings. In other words, a fairly small, very select group. Um, importantly, any disruption brought on by plague would not, for the most part, have played out through tenurial obligations. 7th century aristocrats probably only had light powers over most chaeral tenants in a landscape of sprawling estates. The main burden that Cheorlas owed to these, these, these sort of landlords consisted of agricultural produce, calculated though for a large area, and so only a very small amount per individual household. Feorm is the name given to a later manifestation of this tribute, especially in Wessex, which in at least some cases took the form of a feast where the food render would be consumed by lords and tenants together. There is no indication that these renders grew during the period of the early pennies, nor is there any sign of rents in cash. Mass mortality among the Chirolas would have had a similar effect as it did among the aristocracy. Concentration of land and resources into fewer hands, albeit on a smaller scale, individually, even if collectively there were way more of them. It would follow from this that at least some of the Chiolas became wealthier and had more potential to invest in cash crops, consuming more, but also profiting from the consumption of others. They could even, in structural terms, have become elites in that they no longer participated in direct cultivation of the land, though this may never have been recognised in legalistic terms or only much later, potentially after several generations of economic success. The material results of prosperity at this level are perhaps visible at individual farmsteads like Pennyland in Buckinghamshire, Riley Crossroads in Lincolnshire and Bramford in Suffolk, where evidence has been found of agricultural specialisation and intensification, such as the construction of enclosures and of more permanent buildings. Even more apparent is participation in exchange systems, not least finds of coins and of non-local ceramics. Rising wealth in this segment of society contributes significantly to explaining several other related phenomena. One of these is the intensification of aristocratic land exploitation, elite land exploitation, geared towards large-scale agricultural output on a level far beyond what one might expect of an individual chael household. Yarnton in Oxfordshire was important in hay cropping, while Wick and Bonhunt in Essex and Higham Ferrers in Northamptonshire concentrated on the rearing and corralling of livestock. Who were they producing this magnified surplus for? A second issue is the growth of emporia from the 670s in a manner that strongly suggests royal intervention. Direct settlement expansion is clearest at London, where new phases of growth actually overlay the cemetery of a previous generation, um, and burials with high status and imported goods have also been found at Ipswich and Southampton, suggesting a growing concentration of wealth. Explanations for intensified production and distribution have always suffered from lacking any other interested party. It was not clear where the produce or worked goods were actually going. But if a significant number of Chiolas now had more goods to bring to market and more money to spend in those markets as consumers, the circle comes closer to completion, with the silver coinage being what held it together. A burgeoning market of richer Chiolas offered aristocrats the possibility of increasing their wealth using land and the market, but without the prospect of raising dues on most inhabitants of that land, and coins helped bridge the gap between the two. Holders of bullion, meaning elites, aristocrats, would suddenly have had an incentive to switch to a more granular way of using that silver as they minted coins to strengthen their position in a market that was rapidly recovering and taking on a new, more complex form than here, here, here the form. Most of the products that changed hands in this scenario would have been grown, raised or made in England. They would have been attractive both for production and consumption to aristocratic and cheerful households who simply wanted more and better food to eat. Some foodstuffs would have gone to feed the population of Emporia, partly by commercial routes and partly by redistribution within larger elite property networks. But there were also goods that moved across seas and over long distances. Coin silver was one of them, and although there was a large reserve of bullion in England already in the mid-7th century, it was constantly being supplemented from Frisia, which in turn was probably into obtaining its silver from Francia. Uh, more than 20% of all early pennies found in England belong to types usually attributed to Frisia. These undoubtedly show strong trading links, but they may not have been the main source of bullion, as there was clearly no general requirement to melt them down. Another major input could have been wine, as suggested by Franz Thuis, um, while wool might have already been a significant export. 
Certain woolen items, such as rugs and capes, were a desirable export from Britain already in the Roman period. And the laws of Ina, um, which date to 688 uh, by, by 7, 694, possibly with later additions, uh, these refer to the payment of what was called a gavel quitel, a blanket being paid as rent. Um, one of those per hide was owed to the Lord. Charlemagne, in his famous letter to Offer from 796, refers to an unwelcome recent adjustment in the length of cloaks, which were being exported from England to Francia at that time. And the particular form of Anglo-Saxon market system postulated here, with a prominent role for richer Chiolas, would dovetail well with the form of the wool market as it emerged in the central and later Middle Ages, with sub-elite farmers being collectively the largest producers by far. James Mashall has, con has collect calculated that autonomous peasant producers collectively accounted for over 80% um, of wool production in the 14th and 15th centuries. There had, of course, been centuries of capillary commercialization by this point, but the underlying pattern is likely to be instructive. Most of the 7th century population were Cheolas, with their own land and strong rights over what that land produced, so they were in a position to reap considerable rewards from turning to sheep and wool, um, as the bioarchaeological record suggests was happening widely at this time, and doing other things as well. Now, one question that may be running through some heads at this point is whether the early pennies do indeed represent a commercial economy, and if so, where that commerce took place. Minting at this point was apparently not state-led, um, and instead depended on the direct needs of patrons, usually among the elite. Their needs indirectly supported the subsequent uses of those coins as they passed from one recipient to another, and the large, dispersed distribution of early pennies strongly suggests that, these, that, that, there, that there were many steps in their circulation. This was one of the strengths of coined money. It facilitated economic interaction between groups and individuals with weaker pre-existing social ties. In other words, coins point towards a relatively complex exchange system, and it is likely that this had a largely commercial basis. Law codes and narrative anecdotes make it clear that buying and selling was commonplace in England in the 7th century. Some of that commerce took place in designated market sites like the Emporia, but laws also allow for traders going out among the people, as they call it, upa on folka, um, to do business. And the only requirement was that they carry out transactions before witnesses. The lack of formally designated markets in uh, early medieval England at this time is therefore a red herring. Any settlement or gathering of people, such as an assembly, could in theory have served as a venue for trade. Um, but in the absence of formal markets or larger state structures, concentrations of demand um, would surely have been the largest draw. Elite networks and centres therefore provided a basis for the commercial distribution of goods, and by extension, of coins. Hotspots of coin circulation, sometimes called productive sites, where dozens or even hundreds of coins have been found in close proximity, include several locations that are known or thought to have been secular or ecclesiastical elite sites. Rendlesham, uh, near Sutton Hoo in Suffolk, now provides the textbook case, having provide, produced hundreds of single finds of early pennies and even a, a fair few early gold coins too. This is not to say that all use of early medieval coin was commercial. Philip Grierson long ago argued compellingly that they were also used in gift giving. But many of his strongest reasons for, for saying that, such as the scarcity of fines in the 1950s, no longer apply. And there are no longer any grounds for thinking that gifts accounted for a large proportion of monetized exchange. The same goes for fines and compensations, while money rents are unlikely to have been common in England at this time, as we've seen. Moreover, even when gifts were made with coin, it was often with the expectation of a commercial context for their subsequent dispersal. Different kinds of use were therefore closely intertwined with a solid commercial foundation. Another valid question is how the nexus of amplified commercial activity and monetization fitted in with the rest of the economy. Was this representative of the whole? Probably not. We are talking about a relatively small slice of both the population and of economic activity. Many, probably most people, um, would not have profited meaningfully from the changes wrought by the plague. There were probably quite a lot of slaves in 7th century England, surely more, for example, than the 10% or so of the population um, that was still enslaved in the Doomsday Survey in the 11th century, and those slaves would have seen little or no tangible benefit. And if anything, they may have worked harder, as aristocrats and some chiolas sought to extract more from the soil with less labour available. One effect of this larger slave component would have been to constrain the, the factor market, the labour market, um, for agricultural work, which is an important contrast to the effect of the Black Death in the 14th century, when this is something that changes quite significantly. 
Another constituency whose position materially changed would have been the Chiolas who accepted a closer and more direct form of tenancy from a larger landholder and found themselves living and working on inland, the term generally used for a smaller core portion of an estate exploited for the direct benefit of the landholder rather than being leased out. In effect, this was how large landholders responded to the constraints on their ability to extract more resources from tenants, if that even is the best word for the relationship between them. Inland territories were probably an innovation of the late 7th and early 8th centuries, and not yet numerous, um, though they may well account for some of the large sites of specialised, intensified production named above. Such places needed a large amount of work, much of which could have been performed by enslaved individuals, though not all. In a post-plague climate of reduced population, negotiation with Chiolas over service on other people's property seems to have become a sticking point. That is the implication of a much-debated passage in the Lords of King Ina, and Clause 67, which concerns tenants who must perform labour service if the Lord gives them housing. While another passage, um, Clause 63, spells out that only certain classes, specialised classes of slave, could be transplanted by an aristocrat from one estate to another, suggesting that some lords had been moving a much larger number of slaves. All of this points to challenging circumstances for landholders who had extensive property and wanted to exploit it more intensively, but needed to work harder to find an adequate workforce. These laws probably related first and foremost to elites, though up-and-coming Chiolas may also have encountered some of the same pressures on a smaller scale as they set themselves apart from neighbours. A gradually recovering population in the decades after the plague would have helped fulfil this demand. Now, from about 740, the early pennies were fewer and more debased. In most of eastern England, with the conspicuous exception of East Anglia and Northumbria, they had effectively gone by the 750s. And even in East Anglia, there, there aren't that many of them. This was an inevitable outcome of the dynamic that brought the silver pennies into being. The stock of originally Byzantine silver that had served the English so well was simply depleted. Prolonging the vitality of the currency as long as possible probably had a stimulating effect on the economy. Nick Mayhew has argued that, in contrast, England's staunch refusal to debase its currency in the 14th and 15th centuries helped keep cash scarce and prices uh, stagnant and, by extension, contributed to the country's very slow demographic recovery from the Black Death. In the mid-8th century, coins could have been reminted, perhaps several times, and supplemented to some extent with silver from Frisia, but set against a continually soaring output and decades of attrition through circulation, it was only a matter of time before the silver penny coinage collapsed. Aristocrats could no longer count on a ready supply of bullion or on as steady and fluid a market sector. Tighter money meant more wary use of other resources, and it was at this time that patronage of minsters also dried up and even went into reverse. Clergy at the Council of Closehoe in 747 lamented how kings, aristocrats, and even, as they put it, very many of lower status, minoris potestatis plurimi, envied and coveted the material wealth of English churches. The challenges of the mid-8th century should not be magnified too much. English elites did not abandon the market-based policies of earlier times, and the Emporia um, and Ipswich Ware pottery remained important into the late 8th and early 9th centuries. But their interaction um, with that market seems to have shifted. In addition to preying on minsters and their property, aristocratic landholders can be seen imposing cash rents on rural tenants for the first time, which implies a different kind of exploitation of land, one that was founded on strengthening authority over tenants, perhaps especially over servile tenants who owed obligations to inland territories rather than the mass of Chiolas, um, but a strengthening position all the same. Nor did coinage completely end in England in the mid-8th century. In Northumbria and East Anglia, local kings led the way in establishing new forms of silver currency that regularly carried the name of the ruler, something almost unheard of in the time of the early pennies. And before long, they would be joined by Offa of Mercia, um, who ruled between 757 and 796. Out of scarcity and possibly shaken confidence in coined money, a new model was emerging of coinage under direct royal patronage. By Offa's time, a new pattern was also emerging in the supply of silver, dominated by Frankish sources, prime among which was now the mining complex of Mel in western France. All of these new issues, however, were limited in size compared to earlier times. Southern England was without a substantial coinage until about the 780s. 
The currency underwent a limited revival around that time, though it still got nowhere near the volume of circulation in the decades around 700, and it also hinged on a closer and perhaps shorter-term cycle of trade with the Carolingian Empire. If movements of wool and wine had started to be important in the late 7th century, they may well now have been the main force bringing silver into England with less of a local reserve to rely on. The end of the early pennies contributes to the general impression that they were part of what John Blair has called a spectacular but transient boom, and comparison with England's main neighbours in northern Europe shows that both the peak and the trough of the early pennies were unusually extreme. In Francia, where the coinage was reformed along royal lines by Pippin III in the 750s, at about the same time as in the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms, the late Merovingian silver denarii are difficult to evaluate, but did not peter out in the same way as their English equivalents, and nor was the new royal coinage instituted by Pippin as scarce as its counterparts in the early years of Offa's reign. Frisia and Reba in Jutland maintained coinages of the same general format as the early pennies into the late 8th century and possibly the 9th century, with no apparent drop-off until much later than in England. Silver was therefore still available for minting in other parts of mid-8th century Europe, but the monetary dynamics in England had diminished its capacity to make more coins on the old model. In simple terms, English aristocrats, aristocrats had liquidated their reserves of silver too far and too fast without an adequate supply from overseas to make up for them, and in the new regime, access to new coin was a lot narrower. The breadth and reach of the monetary economy in the late 7th and early 8th centuries had indeed been exceptional. It is important to reiterate that the direct evidence for the impact of the plague of 664 to 687 is entirely literary. The level of mortality it caused and other important details of the immediate aftermath, such as effects on prices, are unknown, um, and, short of dramatic new evidence coming to light, which I would love, but very much doubt, um, likely to remain unknown for the foreseeable future. The cumulative unknown quantities are daunting. One could draw the conclusion that the plague was a figment of anxious rhetoric informed by reading of the Bible and late antique literature, or else that it was so much Brodilian foam swept along on the tides of history, leaving no long-term effect. But to adopt this view is to take absence of evidence as evidence of absence. That is a risky proposition in general terms for a period as poorly documented as the 7th century. Yet it also risks discounting what can be seen in other periods to be an important force for change. There is no inherent reason to doubt that 7th century England was subject to the same general kinds of plague-driven disruption that have been traced so effectively for 14th century England or, albeit on a very different basis, the 6th century Mediterranean, though that is not to say that one should expect the same consequences as in those other cases. The aim here has been to review, with an open mind, how the plague might have affected the several economic changes of the later 7th century. It probably amplified and hastened these processes rather than starting them. Already in the decades around 600, the English emporia were beginning to take shape. Princely burials like Sutton Hoo and Prittlewell demonstrate impressive wealth and long-distance connections, not least in silver. And some minsters and elite centres, as now visible at Liminge in Kent, were taking on monumental proportions. There was also a more modest increase in the volume and distribution of gold coin in the early 7th century. Plague and the death and disruption that it caused could have, would have been a horrific thing to go through. But the argument here has been that the overall, sorry, that the, survive, the overall the survivors in the late 7th and early 8th centuries found themselves living with some significant benefits as a result. It was at precisely the time the plague hit at Emporia, minsters and monetization began to ramp up dramatically. The idea of a plague bonus is new, or at least newly recognised, in the post-Roman world, but is well established in relation to England in the 14th century, where the plague led to a significant increase in GDP per capita, for even though overall output declined, the population fell even further proportionally. In the long run, this led to significant improvement in the material well-being of many non-elites, though that only came after several more complex stages in the immediate aftermath of the plague, and there was also a significant degree of friction in dealing with lords and royal authorities. In 7th century England, the plague led to an injection of resources and energy into the commercial side of the economy. Counterintuitively, this was because other potential areas for change and exploitation were comparatively underdeveloped. England in the Age of Bede and the 7th century plague was an example of what Chris Wickham has called the peasant mode, meaning that landholders had limited seigneurial rights over proprietor cultivators in contrast to the feudal mode where they did. <laughs>
nor was there a significant market for wage labour as there would be in the 14th century. Aristocrats and Chiolas then, who were in a position to benefit from the post-plague conditions, had nowhere else to go. Now, coin played a, a big part in this story. Mark Bloch once described money as like a seismograph that not only detects, but sometimes also causes larger tremors. In the case of 7th century England, coins arguably did both. Their significance needs to be read on two levels. If more coins were being made, that probably says something about power relations as articulated through movable wealth, which is undoubtedly an economic matter, though it is not only or simply governed by economic forces. However, if those coins went down significantly in value and circulated widely and in an articulated way, that says something quite different that there was a well-developed middle level of exchange in which, in which elites and non-elites could participate. Coins were, of course, used for lots of things, but the baseline assumption should be that local commercial exchange was the largest single category, and the one that most helped pivot coins between other uses. On the face of it, then, large numbers of coins of the kind seen in 7th century England should stand for a burgeoning market system and for the growing ability of more of the population to participate in and profit from it. The model of monetization at this time was thus quite different from that of the Central and later Middle Ages. The latter is essentially a matter of supply, the currency being fed richly or starved in accordance with the flow of bullion, which primarily depended on the vagaries of silver mining. Supply also mattered in the early Middle Ages, gold and silver had to, come, had to be acquired from somewhere, but it is increasingly recognised on the basis of metallurgical evidence um, that, that there were large and enduring pools of bullion that circulated continuously at this time. Periodic injections of silver from fresh mines were not the whole story. And bullion not only moved, but changed form. Given the relatively marginal form of monetization prevailing in early medieval Western Europe, a larger role might be assigned to demand than to supply. The wish of those with access to silver, meaning elites in the first instance, to use coin had a powerful effect on the economy more widely. If Bloch's numismatic seismograph did stay in direct proportion to economic complexity more generally, then bead in England would have been significantly ahead of Francia in the 7th to 9th centuries, or even 11th and 12th century England. That is simply not credible. Um, based on other criteria derived from ceramics, documentation, and settlement archaeology, both were significantly more economically complex than 7th century England. But it raises the important and difficult question of what coins do show. Even in the augmented quantity seen around 700, they would have factored into only a minority of exchanges, and the size of that minority could expand and contract rapidly. In one sense, this was a highly responsive area of economic activity. It reflected complexity in a narrow slice of the economy, flourishing when elite interests intersected with those of non-elites and a granular, neutral means of exchange that eased interaction between the two. In another respect, the monetary economy was also highly fragile for precisely the same reasons. It depended on continued availability of bullion as well as continued input of wealthy patrons. Hoarding by elites could derail the whole operation. It follows that early medieval societies could welcome and absorb coined money when it was available, but also do without when necessary. Bloch seismograph thus offers a clear yet only partial reading. Coins, in this case, cannot be used as a direct measure of overall economic activity. The English kingdoms did not then experience a great leap forward in the late 7th century, or at least not one that lasted. Hardly any direct long-term legacy can be identified from the early pennies. Mass use of coins simply did not embed itself into the rural economy. And it might be argued that this is no surprise. The dynamic of production and consumption among elites and peasants, or non-elites, perhaps better, in Northern Europe did not shift on a permanent, systematic basis until at least the 12th century, at which time sub-elites demand became large and complex enough to take on a more dominant role in the economy. Some allowance can, however, be made for oscillation in trajectories of economic development during the earlier period. The era of the early pennies and associated phenomena might be read in this light. For a time, a segment of the Anglo-Saxon farming population was empowered to consume and produce more, with coinage and exchange systems ramping up quickly to support this nexus. This is an example of how regions sometimes veered towards, or away from, greater exchange complexity in the short to mid-term. External shocks, such as plague or extreme climatic events, even peace dividends when violence diminished, could exacerbate those tendencies by shaking up the distribution of land and other resources.
Living through these times, but these, temp these temporary shifts on their own did not transform the core infrastructure of the economy, for good or ill. They built on a background of endogenous local development, which in England can be traced back to the early years of the 7th century, and that picked up steam gradually for a series of reasons of which the plague was only one. Thank you.